Four years ago, I uh, was on a trip with a group of students uh, to Poland. We went to Auschwitz. And when I was there, when I was there, it's a, uh, whatever, as you obviously understand, it's, a, it's just a very, it's, it's hard to put to words what the experience is like. And everyone deals with it a little bit differently. So my attitude was that I wanted to be left alone. I didn't want to be near anyone. And I definitely didn't want to hear what any, anyone's voice is. I just wanted to be left alone. Okay. But you're coming with a whole bunch of students, many of whom have very little background in Yiddishkeit. So there was a feeling that someone has to say something. And so uh, microphones were set up, and there was a lot of kids. It was a f- good few hundred. And a rabbi got up to speak. For the purposes, I'll just say that it's a Lubavitcher, but I'm not going to say any more than that. Rabbi got up to speak, and he basically said, how could this happen? Makes no sense. It goes everything against what we believe about the Ebishter. God is good. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. If you take those three ingredients and you put it together, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. If you take those four ingredients and you put it together, a Holocaust is not shy. It's not possible. So I think the answer is, he said, I'm going to tell you what the answer is. And then he went on to give an explanation. Now, I was getting agitated at the time, and when you're agitated, you're not able to understand what other people are saying. So I cannot say that I properly understood everything that this individual, this rabbi said. But I heard enough to be able to hear the following. It was something to the extent that Hashem wanted to bring Mashiach and wants to bring Mashiach. And in order for Mashiach to come, uh, souls need to be born. And somehow, though I didn't quite understand this, um, Auschwitz enabled more souls to be born, somehow. I'm thinking about it now, and I don't fully understand it, in fact, if anything, to the contrary. But I remember this, that's clearly, without a doubt, this is what uh, was said. Anyways, I was very uh, agitated by that experience. Okay. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, um, is, is he within a framework? Is he with, within a legitimate framework from, our, from a Chabad perspective? Uh, from a Lubavitch perspective, to uh, engage in that type of conversation. So that's pretty much, our, um, that's pretty much the question that we're going to be addressing today. Now, all of us sitting around the table, I think I could pretty much guess what your approach to this question is. So I'll say, I think I'm right. When it comes to the Holocaust, there's no explaining. There's no explaining. We don't do it. We don't explain. You can't understand. If anything, what you say is how you're talking. And with that, it's over. And with that, it's over. Okay. So if I'm right, then the question is, where did, how do we get here? And well, how do we get here? Um, where did this come from? Where did this theology, this very interesting theology come from? And the reason I ask is because <clears throat> ever since Matan Torah, throughout most of Jewish history, there was a very different response to calamities, whether the calamities were big or whether they were small. Anyone who reads... Sefer Bereshis is immediately struck about the fact that most, if not all, of the disasters that occurred in Sefer Bereshis are a response to sin. That's the story of Stoim, that's the story of the Deir HaFloga, that's the story of, um, of the Deir HaMabel, and likewise in the Nevi'im, that's the story of Chorban Ba'ez Rishon, and that's the story of the Chazals that we learn about the three Avedas that caused the Chorban Ba'ez Rishon, and the one of it of Sinas Chinon that caused the Chorban Ba'yesheni. And likewise, if you go further in history, we have, you can collect all of this evidence. After the Crusades, there were Jews and rabbis and prominent ones that said it was because of this or it was because of that. And after the Spanish Inquisition or the expulsion of Spain, there were Jews who pointed to this or to that. And likewise, in each and every generation, you don't have to go any further from the Siddur and where we daven and we say every yomtif and we pray chata'inu galinu me'artzeinu. Rather than just saying, what do you mean? There was a, a, the Rome, Romans, they, there was a revolt, so they came, and that's what happened. No, we don't say that. We don't say that. There, there were Romans, there was a revolt, and, and that's what happened. We say, 
and, uh, and, and Chazal are full of uh, information on this approach. So how do you get from all of that to an approach that says something totally different? And that is, there's no explaining, there's no understanding. In fact, uh, we turn to the Evishter and we say, how are you talking? So the MS is that when we look at the, to- the teachings of the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe about this, we'll see that it's Nishta Zoy Pasha. It's Nishta Zoy Pasha. There is, as I hope to show you, there is a Mishnah Achreina. There is a final uh, statement that the Rebbe made on this subject, and we'll get there. And I'll say right now, I believe that our mind should be formed by, by what the Rebbe said then in a Mugadika Sicha that was edited and distributed and publicized. Uh, so in terms of fi- thinking forward, uh, that Sicha should be crucial for our understanding. But at the same time, I think it would be irresponsible not to know uh, what was said before that, uh, both by the Fidik Rebbe and the Rebbe. Some other things of the material that we are going to learn may make you feel uncomfortable. So that's a little bit of a trigger warning. Uh, and then the question is going to be, if it's making you feel uncomfortable, why is that? I think it's always worth asking that question. If you hear something that you don't like, and you feel it's rubbing you the wrong way, try to identify what is it that doesn't sit well with you. So let's begin. We'll begin with the Sikha from the Fidik Rebbe, Purim Tafshin Aleph. Purim Tafshin Aleph. The Fidik Rebbe is in America for about a year by this point. World War II has been going on for more than a year uh, by this point. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's March of 1941. And there's a long sikha of the Fidik Rebbe uh, 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 that is in, it's printed in Sefer HaSikhis. And here, just a small quote where the Fidik Rebbe says as follows. Ihr muss wissen, you need to know, as Isaris was eaten leiden me ever layan, that the persecutions that our fellow Jews are uh, suffering uh, overseas, zanenit kein sufal, it is no accident. Das is agzeira min hashamaya. This is a decree from heaven. Tigzeira is a straf for shulden. This uh, decree is a punishment for uh, sins. Und in die shulden patir oichachelek. And you, American jury, you have part in these sins. The shulden zainen chilo shabbos, achila streifus, tumas hamishpacha, un adzoi weiter. And likewise, this, where are other similar passages from this kufa where the Fitik Rebbe says this type of thing. And then, the sikh, there's an obvious, so as I mentioned, some people when they hear this idea, they become uncomfortable. So I was asking myself, why is it that I'm uncomfortable when I hear this type of thing? I realize there's multiple things, but on one level, there's an intellectual discomfort. What's the intellectual discomfort? The intellectual discomfort is, one second, if you don't like sinning, then punish the sinners, right? But you have the Sadiq Elyon, the Kedoshim, the holiest uh, Jews, from Chaldeidim, you, you, the biggest Yerei Shemayim, little children. How do, you, how do you transfer all of that? Uh, how do you transfer the concept of sin to people who are the furthest, the furthest, the furthest thing from a sin? So that's an intellectual challenge. So the Fidik Rebbe is aware of that. And so he writes in the Sicha, Menfrekt, why does God's anger pour out in Medina where there's more Torah and Yiddish in America? So that's the question. Jews in America are saying, ah, I don't like this, the theory that this has to do with sin. If it's really about sin, then he would bring it in America, not to Europe. So the Fidik Rebbe says, Umen Farges. As a gitman dafke imponim. This is an expression that the Rebbe repeated on numerous occasions, though the context is is uh, is, 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 is the, the Rebbe repeated this on, on many occasions, but the point here is a patch gitman dafke imponim. In other words, once and, and, and he continues, the Erlech Eden Leiden to live the Nisfrum. So the from Jews are suffering because of the of of the of those Jews who are not from. This comes back to the idea Call Yisrael a raven zabazah. Really, the jury is one body. Is one body. So when the hand is sinning, God forbid, you don't hit the hand. You hit the face. You hit the face. Who's the face? The face is the most tired of our Am Yisrael. The most tired of Am Yisrael is Dafke the Fruma. This is what the Fitik Rebbe said in this particular sicha over here. Now, this is in Tav Shenav. If you look, you're able to see that later that year, there seemed to be a little bit of a change or an update in what the Fidik Rebbe's messaging was. Bagdama, there's a passage in Gemara, text 2. The Gemara says, Rabbi Eliezer Oimer, Im Yisrael Oisin Shuvah, Nigol. If the Jewish people do Shuvah, they will be redeemed. 
Vim lav, if they do not do tshuva, ain nigolim. There won't be redemption. Amalei Rabbi Yeshua, so Rabbi Yeshua tells Rabbi Eliezer, these are two Tanoim who are often arguing with each other, Im ein oisin tshuva ein nigolim. I agree with you. Without tshuva, there is no geula. But... It doesn't end there. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu ma'amid lahem melech. God will appoint a king. Shekzeiraisav kashais kahaman. Who will have terrible gzeiris, difficult gzeiris, persecuting gzeiris like Haman. And what happened by the story of Haman? Haman said he's going to annihilate all the Jews. And what happened? They gathered for three days, fasting. They returned to Yiddishkeit. They did tshuva. And so, likewise, this will happen in the future. V'Yisrael oisin tshuva, the Jews will do tshuva in response to this persecution. And it's going to be that evil king who's going to bring them back to goodness. And indeed, in Takasi, if you look throughout history, that there were many, many times when there was persecution or the threat of persecution, and then Yid and Taka gathered and they said, let's... Like, almost like stories, of, mini stories of Nineveh. Oh, there's a problem coming, let's try to do tshuva, let's up our game, let's become better Jews. This could be easily documented as happening much throughout history. Well, the Fitik Rebbe, starting the year Tafshin, later in the year Tafshin Aleph, started uh, quoting this Gemara. Here's a sample from a letter. Look what he says in this letter. In their sight, when sendliker toisenter von unsere Brüder und Schwester werden euch an achzoriestiken euphen, euskeraten von der Melech Kasha Kahaman, was Hashem is baruch hat euf uns euvgestalt, bichdem ihr sollen schuvetan. Okay, that's a long run on sentence. During this time, when tens of thousands of our brothers and sisters are in cruel ways uh, being worn out by this difficult and, and bad king like Haman, that Hashem put up. Uh, against us, so that we can do tshuva, which will therefore um, soften the, the suffering that exists before Mashiach, and bring Mashiach closer. Where is this coming from? It's coming from this Gemara. This Gemara says that tshuva is a prerequisite, but you don't want to do tshuva. So how do you get tshuva? You get tshuva when you didn't are, are pushed into a corner and they're faced with persecution. They're going to turn to do tshuva. And so during this moment, the Fidik Rebbe is identifying, he says, everyone has to ask the question, Vas habich getan, un vas tuich. What have I done and what am I doing to make this situation better, so far leichter in the Chevle Moshiach, to make this suffering easier and to get the Geula Shlema. This, in fact, quote, uh, a, va- a variation of this quote, is on the title page of the Ayyem Yom, right before the, the Yutas Kislev, there is this quote right there, because it was printed in Tosh and Dalid, in Tosh and Gimel, Tosh and Dalid, the Ayyem Yom. And, and, and this was placed there as a very relevant teaching that the Fitik Rebbe was saying at this time. So what's different here? Instead of it just being the typical God is upset um, uh, that there is non-observance, and so therefore there is a punishment due to non-observance, we're getting here something else. And that is, it, there's a little bit more, I would say, of a positive spin here. We want to have Moshiach. We need to have Moshiach. We're going to have Moshiach. And this is the way to get Moshiach to come. So ultimately, it's similar in the sense that the suffering has happened due, due to a lack of observance of Torah and mitzvahs. But there's two different ways you could say it. One is, if you don't do Torah and mitzvahs, then it says in Parsha Spechukah, which happens to be the Parsha this week, that there's going to be close. So if you're not doing Torah and mitzvahs, it's going to be close. That's, like, that's one way of saying it, which is the first way. The second way of saying it is, we need to have Moshiach, we're going to have Moshiach, we want to have Moshiach. And this is the way to get the tshuva, which enables Moshiach to come. And we see this led to the campaign that we're all familiar with. La alter la tshuva, la alter la gula. Where do those four words come from? La alter la tshuva, la alter la gula. As immediate tshuva is immediate redemption. It's from this Gemara. It's from this campaign. And as you know, the Fidik Rebbe signed off many of his letters during these years, dozens and dozens, and dozens of letters with this phrase of la alter la tshuva, la alter la gula. And the Rebbe did so, uh, the Rebbe did so as well. Until today, the logo of Machni Yisrael. It's the logo of Machni Yisrael, you're saying. Okay. <coughs> Fine. Now, what happened was, the poil, the, the mass tshuva the Fidik Rebbe wanted, didn't happen. Didn't happen. Who am I to say that? The Rebbe said this. After the Six Day War, the Rebbe said that this Eurus that happened mm-hmm. by the Six Day War did not happen. The Six Million didn't get that his Eurus. The Rebbe said this publicly by a fabric. 
In other words, the, the model that the Fidik Rebbe was hoping would happen, didn't happen. It didn't happen. It's interesting, you see, by the Fidik Rebbe, after the year Tavshin Hay, World War II is over mid Tavshin Hay, he's always he's signing most of his letters, La Alta Lechuvah, La Alta Legula. Comes Tavshin, the beginning of the new year, Tavshin Vav, finished. As far as I could find, there isn't one letter from the Fidik Rebbe in Tavshin Vav, Tavshin Zayin, Tavshin Ches, Tavshin Tes, or Tavshin Yud, that has La Alta Lechuvah, La Alta Legula in the letter. If I'm not mistaken, the last one is Reish Chedesh Elo, Tavshin Hay. Now, what's really interesting is by the Rebbe, it's different. It's not our topic for today. The Rebbe is different. The Rebbe continues Laata Lechuva, Tavshin Vav the whole year, Tavshin Zayin the whole year. Then there's a big pause. There's a big pause in the, in the time of Tavshin Ches. And then, and, and, and I don't know, it maybe comes back a little bit, but in the Sikhs, the Rebbe mentioned it as a, as a living and continuous thing. But we see by the Fidik Rebbe that the Fidik Rebbe did not come back to this idea. And at the same time, we have Eidos that the Rebbe said about the Fidik Rebbe. <coughs> the Rebbe said on numerous occasions that once there was a rabbi, a god of Yisrael, who had Yechidus with the Fidik Rebbe. And he started explaining why the Holocaust happened. And he started saying that it's because of this or because of that. And the Fidik Rebbe said, Medarf dem ebishten nit Here I'm quoting from a Sikh of Nasai Tov Shalam Dalit. The Rebbe said this on many occasions. Occasions. The Rebbe went on to say, it's an Indian that's in a moving out in Parshas Kisavoy by the Klalis, it says over there, the Lashon, Vihifla Hashem, that the Klalis is going to reach a stage where it's Vihifla, it's Lamayla Maaseichel, there is no explanation, it makes no sense. There's no need to come and justify and explain. Is this a con? So does that mean we give up on Amunah? No, it's not, it's not a stira to Amunah, the Rebbe says. It doesn't weaken Amunah. Adar Rebbe. Because I know that this came from God, so therefore I have kindness. I know that you are in charge. I know that you are responsible. And it doesn't make any sense to me, and so therefore my question to you is how you're talking. So that's not a contradiction to uh, Emunah. Now, when did the question is, when did the Fidik Rebbe say this? Because that statement, that you don't have to justify the Elish there, that doesn't sound exactly like what we're seeing in Tavshin Aleph and in Tavshin Beis and in Tavshin Gil. So here's what's interesting. There's a Hanukkah of this Sikh in Tavshin Lam this Hanukkah that was written by Rabbi Yossi Hech from the Shliach and Elah. As far as I understand, the Hanukkah that the only Hanukkah that was used in Torah's Menachem is his Hanukkah. But if you go back to his original document, which is not in the Torah's Menachem, but his family printed it in the Chura, he says that the he wrote that the Rebbe said that this Yichidus happened in the year Tavshin Dal, Tavshin Dal in nineteen in nineteen forty four. Now, if that is indeed the case, that's very interesting. The reason it's interesting is because if you look at the letters of the Fidik Rebbe, you see Tosh and Dalid, the tone taka changes. The tone taka changes. The material of, it's because of Averis, you don't see. As you don't see. And although there is a continuation of Atal Shuvah, Atal Gula, but the types of letters that you see over here, that big elaboration on this theme, you do not see in Tosh and Dalid. Number one. Number two, it also happens to be that I've... Uh, I, I, my assessment is that when it comes to the Yonim of Eretz Yisrael, or the future of Chabad and Eretz Yisrael, the key shift in strategy also, we don't have time to get into this now, but I'll just let you know, is Toshin Dalit. If you look at the letters, it's very, very clear. Something happened in Toshin Dalit, after the year Toshin Gimel was over, and in Toshin Dalit. So if it indeed, in Toshin Lamed Dalit, the Rebbe said that this Misa with the God of Yisrael happened in Toshin Dalit, actually fits. So then we would end up having, we would end up having Three stages in the Friedrich Rebbe's response to World War II. The first stage is just to say the concept of The third is to tie it more to a, a Mashiach Dika idea that it's Tshuva that will enable the Gula to come. And then later on in the process was to move to a place to say, actually, we're not doing theological explanations and there is no need to get involved in these theological explanations. However, one second, I should just point out the Rebbe mentioned this about Medarf dem Ebish and Nitfar Enfren many times. Most times he just said the feet the Rebbe said. And he never said when. He never said when. It's not a Nasikha. It was a Yechidis. See, ne- the Rebbe never, in one, so I just told you, one Hanacha said Tafshindalit. But one time the Rebbe said in the Mems, the Rebbe said that it was after the war. The Rebbe said that it was after the war. Okay. So either it was toward the end of the war or it was after the war. Either way, it doesn't change the model that I'm presenting to you is that we have Lechoira 
three stages in the reaction of the Vitek Rebbe to this. This is more or less what I think are, is fact. Is fact. So then we can open a conversation and say, okay, so why, why does the Eifen Hasbara change as the war progresses? So people could suggest different things, but at the end of the day, it's going to be an element of speculation here. I think it will be better if we hold off on this and let's now move to the material from the Rebbe. Yeah. No, no, there's the war. Just with the guy outside, it's a struggle. Is the timeline of when the Zionist movements are picking up to correlate with the, how the Rebbe answered, how the Rebbe said? It's, it's, it's really not for now. Mamish not for now. It's a, an important topic, and we, we once did something on the topic here, and I'm happy to go back to it again, uh, but it's, uh, we'll talk after. Okay, so now, come to the Rebbe's Torah. We come to the Rebbe's Torah, you don't find that the Rebbe says, uh, just like by the Fidik Rebbe, you don't find him really saying the concept of oinish or punishment after, you know, toward the end of the war or after. So definitely by the Rebbe, you don't see that language at all. However, however, you do have, with the Rebbe used a variation. A variation. Very similar, but different. What was it? The concept of Gilgul. The concept of Gilgul. Now this is something that uh, also a lot of people are sometimes surprised. Really? Did ever use the concept of Gilgul to explain the Holocaust? But the answer is yes. So let's see some examples. As early as 1956, we have this letter from the Rebbe in Igris Kedish, where he writes as follows. It basically is like this. The Rebbe has a meeting with someone. The Rebbe has a meeting with someone. This person is not from. The Rebbe t- tells him about the concept of Gilgul in Neshama. So you can have a Neshama that's in one person, and a later generation it comes into another person. This person goes and tells the, a rabbi. Which rabbi? Rabbi Yaakov Shlomo Steinfeld. Okay. He was a big askin in this period. Rabbi Yaakov Shlomo Steinfeld writes a letter to the rabbi. What's the letter? What? Someone who's not from? You're telling him about Gilgal? I don't know exactly what Steinfeld's problem was, but it could have been. That's Kabbalah. That's secrets of the Torah. You don't share that with the people like this. So the rabbi responds, I'm, I'm surprised by your letter. What's there? Why should I not share this concept? So turn the page to page two. In the first paragraph, the Rebbe says, Gilgul is like universal. Everyone accepts this in Judaism. Uh, He doesn't say that. He says, many, many sources say this, including non-Kabbalistic sources. In other words, it's not only Mikubalim that talk about, there are other Gdali Yisrael, non-Mikubalim, that reference this teaching. It's it's spoken about in Nigla. Then look at the next paragraph. Ubefrat. Shadak al Yedei Inyan Gilgal Hanashamis, only through this doctrine, Yeshef Shariyus, do we have the ability, Lahasir Kushye Satsumais, to remove the big questions, Shalachenu Bene Yisrael Bezmanen Uzeh, from our, our, the, our brothers in, during this time, Ubefrachots Ire Bene Yisrael, the young ones, Hamas Boyninim, what's their question? Because they're misboyinim, but Masha Avar Al Am Yisrael Bishanim Achreinis, they think about what happened to the Jewish people in the last in the last few years, and this has a bad effect on them, about their belief in Ashkach HaBratis, and on Hagas HaElam, about creation of the world. The Rebbe doesn't mention the word, the word, the Rebbe does not mention the word Holocaust here, but it's very clear, that's exactly what he's referring to. The Rebbe is saying, that Gilgal, the doctrine of Gilgal, is essential to be able to make peace with, to deal with the problem. How could the Abishter allow something like this to happen, so, to, to come and to say, oh yeah, the Avedis of Ardur, doesn't work. Doesn't work. For whatever reason, he doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a good explanation. People aren't accepting it. It doesn't make sense. Your taka have too many intellectual questions against it. But, with a small variation, it can make sense. What's the small variation? Rather than it being the Avedis of a certain generation, point to previous generations. And once you're pointing to previous generations, so then it's not up to fact that this type of thing could happen. In other words, there were neshamas that existed in previous lives. And they did things that were wrong. They needed to come back. And their tikkun happened through dying of Kiddush Hashem. Their tikkun happened through dying of Kiddush Hashem. This, the Rebbe says, is not only something he spoke about with one person, but the Rebbe is assuming here that this is going to work for the young people to explain it. This is one uh, witness. But the Rebbe says, Al Pishnaya made him Yalkum Dover. So we have another letter uh, of the Rebbe. This one is an English letter. Look at number six. Okay, so the letter begins by saying as follows. You are troubled in your mind by the fate that overcame European jury in recent years and how to reconcile this with the basic beliefs of our religion, etc. That's the question. Now, what the Rebbe does in the first paragraph is he basically wants to argue that the Holocaust is not unprecedented. 
It's not unprecedented. What's the point? The point is, well, if it happened before, then if it wasn't a problem for faith, the tragedies that happened earlier, so then why should this be a problem for faith? In other words, there was a Chorban Bayez edition. There was a Chorban Bayez Shani. There was a Crusaders. There was this, these massacres. So if these things happened before, and if it is Takashru that the Holocaust is in the same boat, is in the same box, is in the same category, so then if those things didn't bother you or people like you before World War II, so then why should World War II all of a sudden become a theological problem? Let's read inside. The terrible calamity which befell our people in our time is unfortunately not the first instances in the long history of martyrdom of our people in exile among the nations of the world. Going back to the destruction of the second base Hamikdash, the Jewish people suffered even a greater calamity. This is very, very interesting, surprising line. Inasmuch as there was no place of res- refuge at that time since Ro- Rome's rule extended everywhere. I partially don't understand what this line means. The Rebbe is saying here, it seems, okay, we have to be careful because Lav Dafka, this letter went out as is. I can't get into that right now, but this is an English letter that doesn't come from the recipient. It comes from the Mendel archive. But this is a little, a bit of a, of a bizarre statement because Rome did not extend everywhere. They didn't, Jews living in Babel, in the Parthian Empire, they weren't subject to Rome's rule at all. But the Rebbe seems to be saying here that Rome had it everywhere and therefore more of Jews were in danger. Even percentage-wise, our Jewish people suffered more at that time than during the recent calamity. And the Rebbe makes another interesting argument here. That if the Holocaust wiped out a third of the Jewish people. The Rebbe is saying that during Chorban Bay Sheni, there was more than a third of the Jewish people who, who were killed. Where are those numbers coming from? How's it been? So it could be from some of that. It's the Gemaras and Gitin uses extraordinary high numbers to describe the massacres that happened at that time. It could be the Rebbe is basing it off of that. <coughs> Nevertheless, the Rebbe goes on to say, it, it didn't turn into a problem for Amunah, so this shouldn't either. We're going to come back to this passage later. We'll come back to it later. But now, let's go to the P.S. On the, at the end of the letter. When the Rebbe wrote a P.S., very often, it was with a Kavana. The Kavana was, I don't want this to detract from the main part of the letter. In fact, there are a number of letters where the Rebbe writes, P.S., I'm putting this in a, P, in a postscript because the main thing is that, and I want you to accept that. Here's another thing, but I don't want it to, to, to detract from the main core of the letter, so I'm putting it in a postscript. Here, it puts in a postscript. What does he say? I do not know your status in regard to the so-called esoteric parts of the Torah. The events in any particular generation, though not necessarily connected with previous generations, can be related to previous generations by means of Gilgal. This means that the soul of a grandfather or ancestor can be sent down to earth as the soul of a descendant in order to complete that which it had not completed during its first sojourn on this earth. What's really interesting about this line here is in most of the Kabbalistic sources, when it talks about Gilgal, it, family is irrelevant. Shmero goes into battle and Yanko goes into Pinchas. Right? Here the Rebbe is talking about Gilgal as an uh, uh, El who didn't finish his mission in life or wasn't successful will come into the grandchild. There are sources that Amban, when he talks about Gilgal, does talk about it, it seems, in a, in a familial uh, context. Okay. From this point of view, the whole concept of reward and punishment need not necessarily be connected with the soul's last descent to earth, but can be connected with its previous descents, descent or descents. So suddenly, there's all the playing field has been brought in. Instead of it being like this, all of a sudden it's like the playing field is so much bigger now because there's so many previous generations that we have under consideration. Now it's all of a sudden nisht ab So here we see a second letter. The Rebbe puts it in a postscript, which tells you that this is not going to be like the main way of talking about the Holocaust. At least this letter is from the 1960s already. This is not the main way we're going to be going about this, but it is something to be used, to be invoked, and the Rebbe does it here as well. Where is this Miyusid on? This is Miyusid, really, and a teaching that goes back to the Mithil Rebbe, because there's a teaching from the Mithil Rebbe about persecution and Kiddush Hashem and, Gil- and Gilgulim. So le- let's read this passage. The Sefer is Shari Tshuva from the Mithil Rebbe, and he says as follows. He talks about the f- fact that during Bayez tradition, what was the major challenge? Avayda Zara was the big challenge in, the, in, in, the, in those generations. So the Mithil Rebbe so the Mithil Rebbe says, like this, uh, go to page 3, he says, Kemoy Shehoya Bizman Beis HaMikdash tradition happened during the first Beis HaMikdash, Bidvar Avedo Zara, 
with respect to idolatry, parku oil me'ay. Jews really struggled with this. And all of those generations did not have their rectification until the time of the philosophers, meaning the very, very Seichel Dike Yidin that lived in the times of Rashi, that's in Svard, and Rambam, that's in, excuse me, Rashi in Ashkenaz, and Rambam in Svard, and Hariza. So what are we learning here? We're learning that the Neshama Sambayi Sedition that struggled with Aved Zara and were punished. They were punished. Asaras HaShvatim were exiled. The Shevet Yod and Binyamin, they suffered a Chorban bias and they went into Galos and they had a 70 years with the Alamaisis, with the, all the persecution. That wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. They had to come down and Google them. When did it happen? For whatever reason, it was delayed. It was delayed many centuries. Many, many centuries. From Bayez Sedition all the way to the, to the second half of the Middle Ages. When? Rashi and Rambam. Rashi's dates are uh, around 1040 or so is when Rashi is born. So to that Kufa of, of, of Rashi. And the Rambam is born around 1135. So this is the era from then until the Alizal. That's when the Neshamas are coming down. What happened during this period of time? What happened during this period of time? That's the year 1096. That's the first crusade. The first crusade that swept through Ashkenaz uh, it, uh, happens in the year 1096, which is Meir Rashi. It's right at the end of Rashi's life. Ad Girish Portugal, Bisman Reishnon Beis, until the uh, expulsion from Portugal. I'm not sure why he uses the word Portugal. Uh, the, the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492. Portugal in 1497, all Jews were told that they are forcibly converted and they're not allowed to leave. So this is that. And all, basically, so there's bookends. The beginning is the Crusaders. The ending is the expulsion. Okay. And then what happens at the end of that? Then the Arizal is born. Ah, Shabazman and Shal Arizal, Bishin, Lamed Gimel, Shaniftar, who passed away in the year 1573, right? He didn't live such a long life. He was born 30, so, uh, 30 or so years before him. But okay, he's right after, he's right after this Kufa of Girush Svar. So Amar Rafaidish, he said clearly, Shabazman and in his day, Patlu Hashmadis, Shahoya Bechol Meshach Hazman Azeh, the persecutions that occurred during this 500 or so year period is over. Erech Tov Kufshana, it's over. The Chol Oisan Shekit Hashem, all of the people who had Kiddush Hashem during this period in time, Hakoyel Hayam and Hashemis, they were all souls, souls. Shahoya Bizman Bez Hamikdash Rishon, that were those souls in the times from the times of the first base Hamikdash. The Yikra Tikkun Oyel, the main Tikkun was. The Mesidus Nefesh of Kiddush Hashem B'mun of Shota. Why? Because they struggled with what? With their relationship with God. And they had Avay the Zara challenges. So what happens? They came back down. They came back down. They died with Amun of Shota of Kiddush Hashem for the Ebishter. Okay, that's a Tikkun for the Avay the Zara that happened earlier. Ach, Bezman Arizal. But once the job is done, the job is done. So Bezman Arizal, Patlu Hashmades, Velo Yehoi. The persecutions are, are complete and they won't happen again. Obvious question when we see this line. They won't happen again. How much suffering happened from the year 1573 uh, until today? Good. The Rebbe addresses the question. We'll get to it soon. But the main thing I want you to take away from this text is, here you see a model. Here you see a model. Perhaps the Rebbe, is, in these two letters, is basing himself on this model. If, if you could say for 500 years of Jewish persecution, that's a lot. If you could say for 500 years of Jewish persecution, in Svard and in Ashkenaz, starting from the Crusaders, going through the Spanish expulsion, and say that all of that is a tikkun for the neshama of Bayez tradition. Okay, so maybe we can say something similar regarding World War II. It seems that the Rebbe is basing himself on this. Okay. Now, publicly, the Rebbe did not say Gilgul. He did not use this explanation. The Rebbe did speak publicly about the Holocaust. The first major elaborate sicha, there were references before, but the first major elaborate sicha Interesting, it was, a, it was Shabbos Bereshus, Tavshin, Lamed Aleph. This was Behemshech to Simchas Torah. This is the very exciting Tavshin, Lamed Aleph, Hakafis by the Rebbe, where he appointed a UN, just so if you just to connect the dots, where he appointed the UN because the UN was making problems and he had the, the Rabbonim and Shluchim who represented all the countries. It was a big, very famous Tishrei by the Rebbe, Tishrei Lamed Aleph. So Simchas, the second Fabrengen, the Shabbos Parshish Bereshis, it was a three-day Yom then. The second Fabrengen, the Rebbe spoke, it was Shabbos Bereshis, and the Rebbe spoke a long Sicha about this subject. It came in, because the Rebbe was talking about Miu Yehudi, 
And because someone in the Mio Yehudi battle said something about the Holocaust, so the Rebbe went a full Sikhi on the Holocaust. We can't learn the whole Sikhi inside. So I made brief bullet points summarizing the main points that the Rebbe said in the Sikhi. As you're going to see, Gilgal is not mentioned here. What does the Rebbe say? First of all, the question that how could God allow this to happen pertains to previous instances of persecution such as the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash and the Crusaders. And yet, this we're not asking questions about that. Why? That also is a theological problem. And the answer is because you only read about it in a book. It didn't affect you. It didn't affect your family. When it affects your family, it bothers you, so you ask the question. But if so, is it really a question? It's not. Intellectually, it should be no different whether it affected you or affected somebody else. Okay, so that's the first point that I was saying. Then he said, okay, but Afal became. Right now, this Yid says, he has this question. So what's the answer to tell this Yid who is bothered? So the Rebbe says, the answer, the answer is the following. We need to understand that a person is made of a guf and a nefesh, body and soul. And the soul is immortal. The soul has a long biography. The, soul, the soul's biography lives on long after a person passes away and exists long before the person is born as well. Okay, so what does that help? Why does that help? Because... Once you understand that, it is possible, because this always happens in life, where we enter a moment of difficulty, perhaps extreme difficulty, for the purpose of a greater good after, right? Every person in their life makes, goes through difficult moments by choice in order to save themselves uh, uh, in the future. Once you understand that Anashama's biography is thousands of years uh, long, so it's not so upcorrect to say that an event happens to a small part of that long biography when the neshama happened to come into the gulf where it went into something difficult, when it went through something difficult, suffering, extreme suffering. So like this. If you only believe in this world and you don't believe in the nefesh living on after, so then you taka a stuck. Because the, the Ebesha created a being who lived a few years and suffered and so his whole existence from beginning to end is suffering. So it makes no sense. If, however, you recognize Nitzchitz HaNashama, the Nisham exists many years before it was born and many years after. So then you could be open to the possibility that an event that happened in 1942 is beneficial for the Nisham in the 1960s and 1980s and for a thousand years from now as well. So really it all revolves around the issue of do we believe in immortality of the soul? And then the Rebbe gave the famous mashal about the surgeon. Very, very interesting mashal. It's a mashal that caused some confusion as we'll soon see. So what's the mashal? The mashal was that if a person goes into the operating room and they never saw a surgery and they don't know what surgery is and let's say they don't even know what the illness is and they see a surgeon with a knife, they're going to scream bloody murder. In reality, the surgeon is helping the patient for the future. So, Allah has come to come us and the Abishter, the gap between us and God is greater than the gap between a child and a surgeon. And so therefore, this would be the way of, ex of, 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 of explaining what's happening here. The Rebbe then continued and said, so how come we have the Gemara telling, telling us, and we see this in Sukkim, that Moshe is protesting. Moshe says, Hashem, why is it that we have a tzaddik v'ra'la, a tzaddik who suffers? Why is it? Lama What are you asking? I just, the Rebbe says, I just gave you a long and elaborate answer. So the Rebbe says, no, because even on the explanation that I just gave, there's a follow-up question. What's the follow-up question? I know that it's Latoiv for this, uh, the, this person's neshama later on. I recognize that. But God, you're infinite. If you're infinite, couldn't you have found a better way? And the fact that you didn't implement a better way, which I don't understand, so therefore I have the question. This is, but after we came, we have to understand what's happening here. There is an explanation. There's an explanation. Nerva then, you have, after the explanation, the question is, yeah, but because you're so infinite, so therefore you could have done it differently. But at least as a starting point, we have an explanation here, and this is the Rebbe said in this Sikh Alam and Aleph. And no, again, notice, there's no mention of Gilgul here. Fine. The Rebbe uh, chose to use very balabatisha terms as much as possible. There are two interesting stories that flow out of this one Sikh. Very interesting. Two interesting stories that flow out of this Sikh. Number one, story number one. In Tov Shin, Lamid, Zayin, I believe, in Eretz Yisrael, Chsidim printed a sefer called the Muna Umad. What's the say for Amun Omada? They want to collect all the letters of the Rebbe that deal with the hot button subjects where there's a confrontation between science and Torah. Put it together in a book. It'll be, it'll be a good seller. Okay. 
if you're going to issues of faith, you can have to talk about evolution 100%. You have to talk about the Big Bang Theory 100%. But you also need to talk about the Holocaust. They didn't have a Gazette's the letter of the Rebbe going through that issue. So they figured, you know what we'll do? The Rebbe said, Let's write it up and we'll put it in. And they wrote it up as if it was a letter. As a series of questions and answers. Whether they had the Rebbe's Haskamer for this or not, I don't know. But this is what they did. In fact, there was another Sikha two years later of Yuralat Nisan, Tavshan Lamed Yumel. And that also is on the same subject. We're not going to review it now, but it's very, very similar to Bereshis. They took the two Sikhs together, they prepared it, they put it in the Sefer. Okay? The Sefer goes into circulation. There's a Jewish woman living in Israel who was in the Knesset. She was a part of Mapai or Mapam, one of the leftist parties. And her name was Chaika Grossman. Chaika Grossman was a Holocaust survivor. She, in fact, was, one of, she was in one of the ghettos. I don't remember which one. She was part of the resistance in the ghetto. She survived. She came to Eretz Yisrael. She was a big macher there. She was part of all the official organizations and a member of government. She sees the Sefer Amun Omada. She's horrified by what she sees. Why is she horrified by what she sees? Well, at least, it could be a number of reasons, but on one level, she completely misunderstood what the Rebbe was saying. In what way did she misunderstand? Let me tell you how she understood the muscle of the surgery. What she understood the Rebbe was saying, and it's even hard to say this, is that the Rebbe is saying that you have a person who's sick. Who's the person who's sick? Am Yisrael. So you do a surgery. What do you do with the surgery? You remove, you remove something, a cancer, you remove a cancer from a body. The Rebbe said that that's what the Holocaust is, right? So what does that mean, the Rebbe meant? The Rebbe meant that the six million are the cancer that had to be removed to help the Jewish people, the body of the Jewish people survive. You could understand how she felt when she, when she saw it. That's what she understood the Rebbe was saying. She writes an article in the newspaper, the newspaper of Hashomer Atzair, in Tav, this is in Tav Shin Mem, the summer of Tav Shin Mem, she writes an article in the newspaper. And she basically attacks the Rebbe. How could you say this? And she goes on and on and on, and she raises a whole bunch of different points. Are you saying about the survivors that, 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 that uh, excuse me, are you saying about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the people who perished in the Holocaust, uh, that, that there were a cancer that had to be removed. How could you say such a thing? And if they were, then all of a sudden the Nazis are good people. And so Hitler is a good person. She's going on and on about this. Okay, obviously the article is sent into the Rebbe. And the Rebbe has this article from Chaika Grossman. And the Rebbe writes a letter back to her. Uh, many letters of the Rebbe you could, are written through the secretary, which means the Rebbe would dictate the letter. And then they would write it, and then they would give it back to the Rebbe, and he would edit it. From this letter of the Rebbe, it's pretty clear to me from the style of the writing, that the Rebbe wrote the whole letter himself. The entire letter of the Rebbe wrote himself. It's printed in the back of the Kutusichis, Chelech of Aleph. And the Rebbe goes through Mech, she wrote an article, and she said so many things, that the Rebbe touched on so many points. It's a limud, this letter is a limud. To read her article, and to go through the letter uh, of the Rebbe, responding point by point. But the Rebbe uh, ad- addressed... Um, uh, one of the things she discusses in this article is she, it seems, preferred the idea that God is not involved in this whole thing. God is not involved in this whole thing. Like, can, are you allowed to say that Hitler is an agent of God? Because if you believe in Ashkach Pratis, then you're forced to say that. You're forced to say Ashkach Pratis means that God is in control of everything, so then that means that God is allowing this to happen, so it means that, the, that on, on some level... He's a shliach of Hashem. So could you really say such a thing? So the Rebbe responded that, look at the Pesukim about Nebuchadnezzar. The Pesukim and Nebuchadnezzar say very, very clearly that God is sending him. That God is sending him. So it's not my chiddush. But then the Rebbe went on to say the difference between then and now. And the Rebbe said the difference between then and now is then it was an oinish. Korban bias was an oinish. And they were warned many times. This is not an oinish. It's just a tikkun. It's just a tikkun. But not an oinish. Now, you have to understand what is that. What does that mean? What does that mean? According to Chassidus, every oinish, there's two ways of understanding oinish. One is, God is mad, so he lashes out. Okay, Chassidus tells us that's not what an oinish is. Oinish is never that. Every oinish is letoivas hanenash. When a yid gets karis, skila, sreifa, whatever it may be, when a Jew is punished, it's what's best for him because it fixes him and it helps him. There's a long arichas in this and many different sources. So every oinish is a tikkun. Here the Rebbe is saying, that was an oinish. 
This is a tikkun. But the Rebbe is saying is as follows. That was an Oynesh tikkun for Avedis. This is a tikkun, a benefit, is to help the person, even though it's not a response to Avedis. That's what the Rebbe means here. Tikkun, every Oynesh is a tikkun. But fine, when an Oynesh is a tikkun, it's because the person did Avedis. Here the, and so the Rebbe is using that was an Oynesh because we cl- see clearly by the Nevi'im that there were sins that happened. So that was clearly a union of Oynesh, which is Latoyvah Hamemash. Fine. This is not even that. This is just a tikkun, a tikkun. In other words, the Rebbe is affirming what he said in Bereshit Islam and Aleph, that there's a, a 5,000 year biography of a Neshama. And for whatever reason, the Neshama needed to accomplish something that's beyond our comprehension. And for it to accomplish this, this betterment of its condition, it had to go through this difficulty. So tikkun, not a response to an Aveda, not a union of Oynesh. Okay, then the Rebbe obviously clarifies in this letter that he never meant to say with the muscle of the surgery that the people who died were the cancerous growth, Chas Shalom. No, the Rebbe said the body is each individual person who died. The body lying on the operating table is each individual person who died. And he went through the surgery for his benefit, not for other people's benefit. For his benefit, he went through the surgery, which is what he said in the Sikh. Okay, so the Rebbe clarified this point. There are other points that you have here as well. But this is very interesting. Why? Because basically, you have one mashal, but you can walk away from this mashal with different messages. What are some of the messages? One message in this mashal is, to fashtesnish. Okay, fine. Another message in the mashal, it's a tikkun. Fine, that's also part of it. But then, there's the misunderstanding of the mashal is, that, oh, the person who was hurt is a chas a cancer. So that's a wrong interpretation of this mashal. Now, it seems to me that um, we have to check. But Bashkafa is showing that Rebbe doesn't come back to this muscle after this. And if this is true, I'm not going to say that I can confirm. But if it is true that after Tafshan Amalaf, if it is true that the Rebbe didn't come back to this muscle, there are other instances and weird. The Rebbe sometimes took reactions by people, especially to when it's not substantive, but it's about a way of going about it. Sometimes the Rebbe took these issues as like an error, as like a simon, that maybe this is not the, the way to go. But again, we first have to confirm if it's the case, but it seems to me that, that that's the case. This is one story that resulted from this B'reish Islam al Then there's another story of B'reish Islam al What's the other story? Rabbi Mangel. Rabbi Mangel is a very, very chashvah yid, a very, very special yid. Our community is blessed that he lives among us. Besides for the fact he's a big goyim and a rav, he also is a Holocaust survivor, and he has a fascinating story about his survival that you could uh, watch online. In this period of time, in 1970, he was giving lectures in New York University. They had invited him. He has a PhD. He was invited to give lectures in New York University about the Holocaust and reincarnation. And he did this. He went, he gave a number of lectures, and it was all about this idea. Not the idea that I told you in the beginning about uh, hastening Mashiach. No. The idea of previous life, something went wrong in terms of what was done, and so a tikkun, uh, a tikkun is, 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 is necessary. He hears the Rebbe speaking about the Fabrin in B'reish Islam and Aleph. The Rebbe doesn't mention a word about Google, so now he's not sure about himself. I think I have this whole beer and I'm investing, I'm doing lectures on it, and here I don't have, uh, and, and here the Rebbe doesn't say that. The Rebbe just says this mashal with the surgery, with the, but without mentioning a word of Google. So he wrote a letter to the Rebbe. And he was mafars in the letter that he wrote, Aksav Yad, he wrote into the Rebbe. And he basically, uh, first of all, he asked the question on the, the Mittal Rebbe. We saw the Mittal Rebbe earlier, where the Mittal Rebbe said, it's not going to happen again. So he asked, how can the Mittal Rebbe say, it's not going to happen again? We see, it happened again. And it happened again and again and again since the time of the Ariza. So the Rebbe explained to him, and the Rebbe did this in a few other places. The Rebbe said, you have to understand what the Mittal Rebbe meant. What he meant to say is, the avoidah of cleansing the souls of bias tradition who engage in Avodah Zara is over. And so therefore, persecution resulting from the cleansing of souls from bias tradition is over. The Ariza on the Mittal Rebbe never intended to say that there never will be Jewish suffering again. That was not their intention. The point was that this specific form of suffering which is, these neshamas, for this sin, that's over, because it was finished by the time of the So this is what the Rebbe explained to Rabbi Mangel in, in his uh, Ksav Yad. And the Rebbe wrote this in letters uh, as well. 
So, okay, fine. That's number one. Then he comes to the part, he writes this whole thing, and he writes that he gives his beer in NYU about, about Gilgul, and the people accept it. The Rebbe circle, people accept it, and the Rebbe wrote, you see it here on your page on the left-hand side, Kivoin shema'aminim b'soyed ha'gilgul. They accept it because they believe in Gilgul. Now, the way he understands this is, this is, the Rebbe is saying, why he didn't say this by the Chabayim. Some people don't accept Gilgul. Now, what does that mean by that? It could be on one level. There were certain some daily Israel who wrote against Gilgul. And was, the Rasag wrote against it. Rabbi Yisrael Abba, the Ikrim wrote against it. Others wrote against it. Or, but it could also mean on a very plain level that the average Jew on the street doesn't use Gilgul and doesn't like adopt it. It's not part of his life. So, and he has the question. So he has the question, and you're going to answer him about a, a concept that's esoteric and that he's not even sure he believes in, so you didn't help anybody. So therefore, he understood this as being the first reason why the Rebbe says he's not explaining. And then why you, it's working. They believe in Yogol, but here it's not. Number one. Number, the Rebbe continues and wrote, Here, the Rebbe is saying another problem with the Gilgul theory. What's the problem? If you have six million Jews, you have to have had some neshamas chadashes among them. Now, what's the number? No one knows. But there had to be some. So then why did they die and suffer? They were never down here before. Likewise, uh, we would uh, have the problem of the who we have established is a neshama chadasha. What was his suffering for? So you're going to need an answer for the Alter Rebbe's suffering, as well as for the Alter Rebbe style people who are among the six million. And so therefore there's an academic problem to this explanation. And therefore I didn't mention it. But the Rebbe then goes on to say, however, I was meramis to it. And what does the Rebbe mean by that? Think about the theory that Rebbe says in Bereish Islam and Aleph, and notice how easily Gilgal plugs right into it. Okay? The theory, Kishla Atzma, is an Ashama has a very, very long biography, and for whatever reason, it, to get a boost, they needed to go through a certain type of suffering. Okay, good. That's without Gilgal. Now, say the same thing with Gilgal. The Neshama has a 5,000 year biography. In a previous life, it did something wrong, and so in order to get fixed up, it needs to go through the suffering which will help it in the future. So, the beer that the Rebbe said is fully compatible with the concept of Gilgal, but it also stands alone. It also has merit on its own. But again, the, the Rebbe mentioned to Chaika Grossman that it's not about Oynish. So there, it's like, no, it's nothing to do with Oynish, which what I have to assume also means not Oynish in a past life. So this is interesting, and where we end up having this Sikha, and the, and the Rebbe giving this uh, explanation to Raman Bangel, and, uh, and, oh, so about the general. He wrote at the end, Ha'im Nochenu is my explanation, right? Rebbe wrote Pechlal. Generally speaking, it's good, but it's not perfect. Generally speaking, it's good, but it's not perfect. Okay, so this is the answer that we have. Uh, this is the answer that we have from that year. Mm-hmm. So if we summed up... The difference between is if it's over or something that you did or if it's not something that you did. So that's interesting. It's if, not a English, it could be that it was from previous years. Okay, so if you want to say that tikkun means you didn't do something wrong, but your neshama did something wrong in a previous generation, that's, I, I, I can't argue with that. It's possible. Possible. So what do we have so far from the Deba? We have Gilgul in three letters, essentially, three letters, and a long sikha that doesn't use Gilgul, when the Rebbe goes out of his way to say, not Oynish, but that it's compatible with Gilgul. Okay. Then the years move along, and we come to Tavshan on Aleph. And come to Tavshan on Aleph, there's a change. There's a change. What happens to Tavshan on Aleph? The Gulf War is about to happen, and there is a person who gets up in Israel and says, that just like the Holocaust happened because God got tired of our sins, so is happening now. And so therefore, we better fix up our ways, because otherwise, Saddam's scuds are going to cause a second Holocaust to This is what someone said in Eretz Yisrael. The media picked up on this, because they love when from people say these types of things, because it's good for them. And so, they publish it. And the Rebbe sees this, and the Rebbe is very unhappy. And the Rebbe dedicates three consecutive weeks of sikhis attacking this approach. Vayichinun Aleph, Shmois Nun Aleph, and Vayira Nun Aleph. The Vayichinun Aleph, the Rebbe quotes two chazals. Two chazals. One chazal is the story of Rabbi Kiva and Menachis, Tav Choftes Hamid Beis, where Moshe Rabbeinu is shown the suffering of Rabbi Kiva. He protests to Hashem, 
Hashem says, This was what I, this is, be quiet. This is what was Eila in my machshava. This is what arose in my thought. Quiet. What's the question here? The question in here is, why didn't Rabbi Hashem just say, Oynish Avedis? Or why didn't he just say, Oynish Gilgul? You have explanations, God. Why are you saying Shisai? Then we have a Medish Rabba. The Medish Rabba says about Moshe Rabbeinu that we had the suffering of the Jews in Egypt. And although I said before that most suffering in the Torah is connected to a sin, what sin led to the suffering in, in, in Mitzrayim? And Moshe Rabbeinu is quoted in the Medrash as saying, I investigated about the Mabal, I saw, Mitas Hadin, they deserve punishment for what they did. Dora Flaga, same thing. Stein, same thing. In other words, Bereshus does a pretty good job at documenting the sin that le- leads to the catastrophe. But Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't see and understand why the Jews are suffering in Mitzrayim. And that leads him to say, Lama Adayis, Lama why have you uh, done this to the people? The Rebbe uses these two Mamari Chazal and says, that this forms the basis for an approach that says that there is suffering that happens in this world that is not a result of sin. That is not a result of Oynish. And here, let's look at the Sikh and Toshan and Aleph and see what the Rebbe writes. There are some negative things that happen that's not a punishment. This is what God decreed. Without any reason... In the logic and wisdom of Torah. In other words, you cannot use Torah to understand why this event happened. I need you to understand how radical this is, because the Rebbe always said how Torah explains everything. Because it's talk about Isobara Alma, because the Torah is the blueprint of the world world, therefore everything in the world we go to the Torah and we have an explanation for everything. Here the Rebbe says there's an exception to this rule. There are some things where there is no Hasbara and Torah to explain this event. Imagine if you try using math to understand, to explain what love is. It's the wrong tool. Mathematics is not going to get the job done. So just like you understand that math can't do that, Torah can't explain why this event happened. Chazal, Quiet, this is, what, what, uh, um, this is what arose in my thought. And then the Rebbe goes on to quote Bris ben Absalom, and he concludes concludes the paragraph by saying, The destruction of six million in the most wicked and terrible way. A terrible Holocaust, never, there never was anything similar in all the generations. This line, I hope you remember, is a little bit of con- in contradistinction to what we saw earlier, where the Rebbe was saying there is precedent. And by the way, that letter to the Rebbe is not the only one. Where the Rebbe was saying, no, there are some other tragedies that maybe in some ways were bigger. But here the Rebbe takes a different approach. It's so different. So therefore, it cannot be a punishment. Satan himself cannot find the Cheshvan Avonis in that generation. It's interesting, he says that generation. The Satan would not have been able to find the Averis in that generation to justify it. Those words, Badurahu, are interesting because, oh, so what about other generations with Gilgal? Is Gilgal on the table still? We'll soon see. Then the Rebbe goes, There is no explanation through Torah. That this is what God wanted. So when I read, I read this, the Rebbe says, There is no theory in Torah. To me, Gilgal is a theory in Torah. If you're saying there is no theory in Torah, so that negates Gilgal. Okay, fine. But then it gets stronger. Why? Because in the footnote, the Rebbe brings the whole middle of Rebbe. And he brings the Mithra Rebbe says that it's not going to happen again. It's not going to happen again. The last time, what, how do we touch? What does it mean it's not going to happen again? He said that the Nishamas of Bayez Edition, the Nishamas of Bayez Edition, so that job is done. So that's not going to, so no more Bayez Edition of Vedazara suffering is going to happen in this world. Here, the Rebbe seems to take another interpretation of this uh, mimer of the Mithra Rebbe. The Loyia Oid is a little broader. There will be no more Gilgal suffering for previous generations of sins. There may be suffering, 
but no more Gilgal suffering for any previous generations of sins. And the, the Rebbe quotes the whole thing, and he writes, This is an added explanation, if we need it. It's a standalone thing. Notice here. It's not even two. It's not oinish, and it's not tikkun. Why? Because the Mitla Rebbe said that that is not going to be more. What's the that? The that is Gilgulim. So in other words, what you have here in the Sicha, pretty clearly, is not only walking away from the idea of Avoinus per se, but even the idea of Gilgul. Any theory, any Torah theory. Why? Because this is the Abishur, so to speak, as he transcends even Chachmas HaToyrah. And so therefore, Torah is not going to get it. If you're Mamish the Abishur, then you can get it. But if you're not Mamish one with the Abishur, Torah is at one step below, so it's, it's not going to get it for you. Okay. Now, we have to, we have to wrap up. So, but what it, but one, one of the things... One, yeah, one second. So one of the things that Rebbe said over here is this idea that it seems that it's unprecedented. In other words, what allows us to say that this is in the Rabbi Akiva basket, that this is in the Brisbane Absarim basket, rather than that whole basket that we spoke about earlier, that is Avera based. So the Rebbe seems to be saying the primary argument is the fact that it's unprecedented. The very fact that it's so out and uh, uh, it's extraordinary, so different from anything that happened before, that enough is reason to put it in this box that says it has nothing to do uh, with Havis. So what's interesting is, there was a Bikitza Nimritz, there was a, a Rebbe in the Polish Shigero, his, in the Var Shigero, in Warsaw Ghetto. His name was Rebbe Kleinimus Kalman Shapiro. And he wrote, he used to say drushes to Tchsidim in the ghetto. And he wrote them down in a notebook. And he was, then the Warsaw Ghetto uprising happened, he was transported and he was killed. His book survived. His book survived and it was printed. When they took the book, they printed the Dvar that he said in the Warsaw Ghetto. One of the things that they found is that he also made Tikkunim. He added, so what happens is, he gave a talk, Chanukah Tavshan Aleph. Hanukkah Tavshan Aleph, he gave a talk. And one of the things he said is, why are people losing faith? Like we saw earlier, the Rebbe said, why are people losing faith? Churban Beis HaMikdash. It's just as big. Beitar, just as big. And that didn't bother you. So why is it this all of a sudden? In other words, he was giving them a little bit of Musr, and he was saying, this is not unprecedented. And he said, Befeidish, Hanukkah Tavshan Aleph. Those who say that what's happening now is unprecedented are wrong. Well, two years later was Hanukkah. as Yud Ches Kislev, a few days before Hanukkah. And what happened? What changed? Yud Ches Kislev before Hanukkah. The deportations out of the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka, which started the mass murder of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of Jews, started in the end of Tavshin Beis, the summer of Tavshin Beis. The summer of 1942, that's when the, so to speak, final solution was, began being implemented. It was not the case before. The, the Friedrich Rebbe's daughter and, and son-in-law were killed a few months later in Treblinka, Rosh Hashanah of Tavshin Gimel. So he's looking over now, it's Tavshin Gimel, it's a few months after they're having these deportations and they're already learning all what's happening. And he says, he reads this, and he's horrified by what he wrote. Because he's like, no, that's not true. It, it, it's not. And what does he do? He takes a pen and he changes what he, he writes, Haga. And Haga is right over here in 15. Look what he writes. Only the suffering till the end of Tavshin Beis is precedented. So we never had anything like this. So here we see something that the Rebbe is pointing to as well. In the Sikh and Tavshin on Aleph, the Rebbe is pointing to the fact that it's unprecedented. The f- despite the fact that we have, on, on a number of occasions, the Rebbe is saying in early years that it is precedented. And that seems to be the primary reason, the Rebbe says, that we move it out of the realm of sins entirely. So you, what you see here is you really see a trajectory. Start all the way at the beginning, where we started with the Fidik Rebbe. It's straight up, straight up Avedis, like with, with, like with no commentary. And then we saw that then it got framed as part of the Hachana for Biyas HaMoshiach. Similar, but it was part of the Hachana for Biyas HaMoshiach. And then we saw the Fitik Rebbe move into a mode, and we're, we're not explaining. We're not explaining. But, fine, 
At the same time, we saw that the Rebbe was using Gilgal. And then, even when the Rebbe wasn't using Gilgal, giving Epis an explanation. Epis an explanation that is better for the Neshama for later. It's my contention that in Toshim and Aleph, the Rebbe is putting all of these aside. Even the Sikh, even the Marshal of the surgery. Even the idea that the Neshama has a biography and so it went through difficulty now for a benefit that's later. That itself is a Hezber. That's, uh, that's a Balabakasha Hezber. I think the Rebbe wants us to put that to rest as well. So, does it affect the Muna? The Rebbe is saying, no. We know the Abish is in control of everything. But this is why we're at a place where the assumption most Labavichers is that we don't talk about it in the sense that we don't explain why it comes from somewhere. I'm showing you it comes from somewhere. But till you get to this somewhere, was a shtikol mahalach. Was a shtikol mahalach until you get to this somewhere. So therefore, I felt, coming back to my opening, that when that rabbi got up in Auschwitz, and gave that speech and said that this is a way of expediting Mashiach's coming, I think that was inappropriate. I don't think that was the right thing to do. I understand it. So, and now I'll conclude with saying, human beings, especially people that talk a lot like me, so we like to explain everything. And sometimes we have to recognize, we have to remember that I'm all silence is the, is the right approach. And Muna always, a Muna always, that's another important thing, it can't be Maidech too much, but a Muna remains, but... That doesn't mean that we always need to explain. Sometimes we need to have the humility to recognize that the Ebesher is way beyond us and as much as we're going to try and climb, So yes, we're seeking a relationship to be close with the Ebesher and that's where we get into this mode of I get you and you get me and I feel you and you feel me and I explain you and you explain me and that's good. But sometimes he reminds us that at the end of the day the Ebesher is the Ebesher and we're in a Nivra and the Ebesher should help. There should be Achtoi Vechesed for all of Am Yisrael. Thank <laughs> you.